Tom. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Varellen. Uh, it's been a few years, exactly, actually, three and a half, I think, since our last event, October 19, uh, which is three years, I must say. Um, and it's good to have you all back. I think we have a wonderful panel here together for you, and uh, hope you enjoy the show. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, hello and welcome everyone to Designing What Matters. My name is Andrea Lillo and I'm the executive editor of Designers Today. And I'm so excited that you decided to spend your evening with us to learn about uh, this really important topic. So every choice we make when designing a home, whether it's for ourselves or for a client, it really should be made with intent because whether the space is being built from the ground up or we're selecting furnishings such as carpets or artwork, everything should reflect the values of the people who are in that space. And so that's what we will be diving in today. Uh, but first, I wanted to go down the line and if our panelists could just briefly introduce ourselves and then we'll, we'll dive in. So Rachel, we'll start with you. Hi, I'm Rachel Grahowski, founder and principal of RHG Architecture and Design. I'm Tom Pazas. I'm uh, representing the company Jornis uh, Boutique. Uh, my name is Zubair Amadi, and I am one of the owners of Amadi Carpets, along with my three other brothers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Brandon Snyder, Vice President of Business Development with Ferellin down in High Point. Wonderful. So Rachel, I'm going to start with you. Um, I know your company's mission is to uh, really connect the spaces with your clients and their values. So what does designing what matters, what does that mean to you and how do you manifest, manifest that in your design work? Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, first of all, part of, part of this conversation started for me over the last three years, I was really searching for words uh, to connect and words and concepts to con to connect uh, the essence of design and really thought a lot about you know what does it mean why do we do it and I thought about what is what is structure and and that architecture in and of itself originally was like to protect us right and then as as we moved past that sort of baseline, design and architecture became about getting closer to God or to spirituality. And so I started thinking about the value that we were giving to our clients, the, the invitation um, to be in community, to uh, relate to each other, to, um, feel at peace in, in your home in particular, although we also are trying to work with this in community projects as well as uh, other commercial projects. And so the way that we do that is it's really getting to understand who the client is. You know, how do they want to feel? Um, what makes them, what are their aspirations? What, what makes them feel grounded? Um, and invite them into the present moment. Because when we're in the present moment, then we have this ability to not just connect with others, but connect with ourself. Um, we have the possibility of uh, uh, growth and really seeing the beauty that surrounds us. Wonderful. Thank you. So uh, Brandon, Varellen's whole, uh, whole philosophy around design is bringing together creators and artists, artisans, who not only make beautiful products, but also uh, include values such as equity and sustainability. So can you talk a little bit about how, how uh, the founders founded Varela, like what's the, and what's the mission behind it, you know, in terms of um, how, they, how their Belgian roots kind of influence their, their mission? Well, I mean, the Belgian roots, for me, um, you don't find more hospitable people. And what's so fascinating in particular about Thomas, I mean, not talking about them, but if, if it's a car ride, if it's a great wine, if it's food, if it's their garden, they want to share it. They want you to be a part of it, not because they're showing off, but they want to see the smile on your face that you're having a great time. And I think they've incorporated that 
that whole mindset into what they're doing now with the furnishings um, and with what we curate with all of our friends that if you have something, it is nothing without sharing it. It's nothing without really the story of community of being gregarious and mm -hmm. allowing others to enjoy the same things that you are. And, you know, also there's, they've surrounded themselves with people with great taste. They have great taste. Um, and that taste isn't in something that's glitzy. It's not in something that is uh, bright and shiny. Mm -hmm. That taste is in something that is calm and experiential. And they first and foremost have it in their own home, invite you into that home to be a part of it. They've traveled the world. They've seen things throughout the world that adds that calming experience. They've met people along the way that added that calming experience. So let's curate this experience. It's not a matter of just bringing a chair into someone's life. It's a matter of being, bringing prescriptive rest into someone's life. And we need that now more than ever. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's like almost like community building too, right? Yeah. You want to bring people in the home and uh, when you're living life, you might as well make it as, as beautiful as possible, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Zubair, you have a very interesting story. Um, it's fascinating. You, you, your family left uh, Afghanistan as refugees and you settled in uh, West Hollywood. So you can, can you talk a little bit about how you went from A to B? and then how uh, your journey informs your company. Uh, well, we, um, we were very fortunate enough to uh, be born in a family that, um, that have this craft for the past mm -hmm. three uh, generations. Um, when we came to the US, we were fairly young. It was uh, end of 1986. And because we had a uh, skill in weaving and as well as restoration of um, antique textiles and rugs, we were able to uh, get on our feet and uh, you know start working at a young age. Of course, like everybody, um, mm -hmm. and and that skill sort of like helped us through uh, the years and helped us with the development of of getting back into uh, weaving uh, handmade rugs. So. Um, about 24 years ago, we started uh, to go back to. At the time, Afghanistan was uh, was was not safe, so we were we started our workshop in Peshawar, Pakistan, mm -hmm. where a lot of uh, Afghan refugees were fleeing the Taliban at the time, uh, and so we set up shop there with starting with five looms, and because we had the knowledge of working with antique rugs. Uh, we took some of that knowledge and reintroduced it in making new rugs. And typically in Afghanistan and Afghan rug weaving has their own tradition of styles and colors and designs. This was bringing something totally new to these weavers who were kind of like, what are you doing with these patterns? Mm -hmm. or, this is not something that we would weave. So it's something that uh, we kind of introduced slowly and started a whole uh, industry uh, to, to make rugs that are not your typical Afghan rugs, but beyond that. So, uh, yeah, that's how we... So it's like you just take the, the motifs and the influences and, and make it for uh, today, or...? You, yes, absolutely. I think it's, you know, getting, like Brandon said, uh, you know, you're getting inspiration from from not just um, your own uh, industry, but also from other industries as well, other home furnishings, mm -hmm. textiles, uh, art, um, architecture, and you want to bring patterns that congeals really beautifully with what is being made in terms of furniture or um, art and architecture and all that. And also, I was curious, like, why West Hollywood? Was it the weather? <laughs> <laughs> no, we actually, uh, we, uh, we grew up in the valley. To, uh, to, you know, I don't know if you guys know the valley in, in LA, but uh, West Hollywood is uh, the center of uh, home furnishing goods. Mm -hmm. And so it's a place where we started our uh, repair shop, actually, when we had a small repair shop working on antique rugs and textiles, re restoring them. And as as time went on, we then that's sort of like been our um, place. And do you still restore rugs? 
Uh, I can actually. <laughs> he hand mends them during the show. <laughs> Okay, uh, so Tom, you represent Eddie Van uh, Jessel, yes, and yeah. um, which is his work is is displayed in New York City, I think, for the first time, right? Correct. correct. And it's beautiful. You can see it displayed here. Um, so obviously, art is such a reflection of our personal values. So can you talk a little bit about Eddie and how he works and his inspiration? Yeah. So uh, Eddie is a photographer out of Belgium as well, uh, spending, let's say half of uh, the year in uh, Lamu, Kenya. And uh, as, a, as a young boy, he went to, uh, with his uncle who was a missionary to Kenya, and he was intrigued by that, that, uh, that country and, and the nature, etc. Um, in a, at a certain moment, uh, let's say, I think it's 12 years ago, he was introduced to Hadija. Actually, that's the lady uh, here. On that picture, and mm -hmm. that lady came to to Eddie and says, "I've heard about uh, some uh, Afro American lady who's very known, a model, a certain Naomi, Naomi, whatever Campbell." Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but she said, "We're pretty as well." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, can you launch us as well? Because it's not about it's not always the Caucasian ladies, but it's, we have we have beauty as well in our genes, etc. So um, he um, he launched uh, Adija, and every picture that is being sold, uh, and they're all limited. Right? So the print run is all uh, limited to twelve worldwide. Uh, every picture being sold, um, he contributes to the community of uh, Adija's community in Kenya, um, and that's one. And actually, you see it in, in, his, in his art. It's pure. It's it's honest. It's very. It's it's a uh, tribute to the African Afro American uh, woman being the cornerstone of society, mm -hmm. and uh, it shows in the pictures. Absolutely, yeah, beautiful. So Rachel, you work with commercial and residential projects throughout the nation. So how do you start the conversation with your clients on finding out their values? Do you give them a list of questions? Do you visit them in their spaces or do research? All of the above. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, for me, first of all, it's really helpful to be in the same room with the client. Um, I know that a lot of, a lot of designers uh, have gotten really adept at working on Zoom, but for me, I really want to read the energy of the client. And the client, I'll ask a question and they might answer something else, right? And so like, I have to see their body language when they respond to that because you know, I might need to ask the question a different way. Because really what I want to know, and I kind of touched on this a minute ago, is that I want to know who they are. I want to know, like how they want to live, what's missing, you know, and that's true with a brand too, or when we're doing a community project, you know, what's going to bring people in, what's going to want, make them want to stay, what's going to want them, make them want to like spend money there, and, and in order to understand that, I really have to dive deeply into who they are. Um, sometimes it's, of course, going through their space, maybe the space that's not working, you know, I see it a little bit as doing magic. It's like shifting energy at will, right? Like that's what we're doing. That's what we're, you know, when you're really working intimately with someone. Um, and in their home, that's what it is. It is very intimate. There's nothing that makes me happier than when a client comes back to me and says, uh, you know, this literally bathroom, literal de bathroom design that you did has changed the relationship between me and my husband. We actually talk to each other more now. Right? <laughs> or, you know, now my family sits down together at the dinner table and we have a conversation, and that didn't used to happen. Mm -hmm. Right? So things like that are, are really like, I want to know what their hope is so that then we can create a design that's going to support that dream. Can, can, I, can I mention something yeah. with, with you speaking? So, like, think about it. Like, all of us are involved in participating in these sacred spaces of people's lives. Like, think about that. These are rooms where babies are made and where people die. These are rooms where, like, I mean, everything under the sun happens where we get to be a part of that. Uh, totally. And, and, like, layering on that, this idea that life is a ritual. Yeah. 
-hmm. right? Like everything that we do is, if chosen to be seen this way, is a ritual. So whether it's taking a shower, making a meal, or even cleaning your house, right? Like it's all, it's all the beauty of life, right? And our, our interiors are really an expression of ourselves more than other aspects of our life, and that's how you, you choose to live, which is so interesting. Uh, and I was curious though, do you still do any Zoom or no more Zoom? <laughs> no, we still do Zoom. I just, you know, as soon as I can, I, you know, if that client is unavailable, as soon as I can, I get in the same room with them. Right. And I walk through their houses, of course, and, you know, um, in particular with finishes and furniture, I will not, if, if a client has not touched at least a fabric, they may not have had to sit on the chair, but I just, I won't order it because it's just, it's, it's an emotive experience. Mm -hmm. And I want them to really know what they're, what that's gonna feel like for them. I mean, again, to the point of like, what does it feel like? What if like, you know, you're talking to a client and they say, I love modern, but then you, you realize they really don't, or they, you know, they, how does that, you know, when they're telling you things that you, you get the sense it's not true. Yeah, I mean, I love that. I, um, I talk about that with the clients actually, that, language is not verbal language is not enough that we have to use like another layer of visual language and so that if somebody says to me i like modern mm -hmm. and they show me something and i'm like yeah that's not really modern okay. <laughs> so here and sometimes sometimes we'll survey clients like if they are a little indescript and i can't really get a vibe from their current house and this is true with brands too you know i'll like put maybe four or five images in front of them and i'll just say tell me what you think what do you love? What do you hate? Mm. And so again, it's like creating a level of intimacy with the individual, but then again, this can happen with the brand as well. So. Right, that's interesting, yeah. okay. So you've all kind of touched on how products are not just about you know, how they're designed, but how they make us feel. So I was wondering if each of you could talk a little bit, elaborate on how do we make design evoke feeling and you know especially nowadays in the last two years it's been very challenging where people want to go home and be in their own space that makes them feel good what's the any, any thoughts something that we observed was last market we were all <laughs> heavily libated around a, a fire mm -hmm. ring and uh, and talking but you know you look at the areas of the world that I think all of us are most most inspired by are typically areas of the world where like there's large palisades and fences and like mm -hmm. their home is their venue. So they're not going out, mm -hmm. they're entertaining in the home with neighbors and friends and family. And, and really these places, parts of Europe, parts of South America, Mexico, other places where design is just like on point. The home is the center of activity, but the world was a less safe place than maybe the US. So we weren't used to that word. We go out all the time. Like, so we had a new danger the last two years. Mm -hmm. And the same philosophy that the rest of the world has been experiencing for millennium, now us, you know, the, the baby of the world who all bright eyed and thinks the whole world's safe, it's not safe. Mm -hmm. And so we started turning inwards and making the home the venue again. Mm -hmm. And I think it really provided an opportunity for us in the West and in the US to evaluate the products. I mean, I know our, our own designer, I know Tom and, Tom and Sabine, you know, their home is a, is a safe, again, calm place. And, and our designer, Paul, looking at that and saying, I want, I want comfort first and foremost. Mm -hmm. I want soft, I want texture. I want something that's conversational, something you can sit in, for, I mean, you can sit in that chair for hours, yeah, yeah. hours on end. Um, so anyway, that's, that, so I think that's something you, interesting to talk, you know, yeah. to know. Yeah, uh, so like in the last two years, you're, you've seen the companies, you, you, the design has kind of changed to incorporate that? Yeah, and be more home-centered, more like the home is the venue for all forms of entertainment. You know, not just a simple dining table, but I mean, for us, we made like these incredible, uh, we took a yan chair, which is a, a very simple occasional piece of ours. Uh, it's an armchair. We lowered it to make it a dining chair. We lowered a dining table that was hair on high, and we did one that was 140 inches long and had 10 chairs around it. And no, you sit and you dine here and, and, and talk and, 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 and libate for six hours on end, you know? So th that's how we were answering that sort of call. Right, right, yeah. okay. Yeah. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. uh, for me, the, the, the pictures, uh, it's, it's the artwork, it's, it's, it's a way of traveling. Mm -hmm. uh, if you see uh, Dija or the, 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 the seal out of Lamu, 
it brings you in a total different world uh, and it makes you think and, and, and uh, what is the message of, of that lady? She has such a strength um, and anyone can give another uh, interpretation but it makes you think and that's for me or, or travel throughout your mind or, or uh, the world is it what yeah what's the message there is a message she's giving a message and everyone has another an, another interpretation but certainly has a message and that's for me extremely important mm -hmm. and also these these uh, pictures of, of the, uh, the sea out of Lamu uh, it's, it's less confronting but it makes you dream mm -hmm. and that's that's extremely important for me. right if you can't travel like loves haven't True. been able yeah. to in the last yeah. two years yeah. now you have other ways to kind of connect with that so indeed indeed yeah. <clears throat> okay so yeah no so um you know one of the one of the things that i've always found really interesting is is the ability to create like a calm peaceful space I mean, this showroom is like a perfect example of it. Everything in here makes you feel something, right? And so I, I have always found that it's like a balance between the information and the no, the, and no information, right? Like I, I was just in this spa the other day and it was like a Ayurvedic spa and the walls, the all, walls had, the, three of the walls had different fabric wall cover in sort of Indian designs. And then there was this little niche that was just cream colored, you know, it was like the color of the walls in here, and then a Buddha. And so, you know, what you, in this room that actually had quite a bit of texture, your eye was brought to this, this sacred piece, and, and it was, that's where you pause, right? And so in design in general, like that's how I feel we create uh, emotion mm -hmm. is that it's the balance between the texture uh, the soft and the hard the textured uh, and the untextured the you know maybe it's shiny and, and matte um, and when you do that and then maybe it's you know artwork and neutrals mm -hmm. you know that's it's what does your eye go to you know I often say that if everything is beautiful nothing is beautiful like you don't know what to look at so the idea is that you're creating something that, that brings somebody into the moment and you can see the beauty, because we forget to see the beauty. And in your, your designs, do you have you know, one, one or two statement pieces to kind of you know, draw so that's where your eye can travel to? It so depends on the client, because it might be, again, it might be about travel, something they picked up when they were traveling. It might be a family heirloom. It might be something new that, you know, a client, you know, we, we presented to a client they just fell in love with. Um, it could be a handmade piece. I think, you know, to the point before, like so much of it is about the storytelling of the piece. Mm -hmm. So if you picked it up when you were traveling, it's the whole story of that travel. Right. But it, or an heirloom. You know, I I um, for a while had this this line that was all reclaimed furniture, reclaimed wood in furniture pieces and the first set of pieces was made out of wood that came out of a church that we were renovating and somebody said to me like think about all the like prayers that went into that oh, that's wood that's yeah. sitting in that wood yeah right and now that's part of your home right. and so those stories are what bring us into the moment so that piece is now a story right and it could also be you know, the tools that you use to cook a meal. So, I mean, the statement pieces are really personal, and that's when we're designing what matters, right? Because we're bringing those pieces, that, that whole story along from, you know, the past into the future. And if those prayers, prayers were answered, that would even be better, right? That would be fantastic. Be exactly. you know. and, and you might not even know they were yours. They might have right. been somebody else's, right. but you get that. Right, that's what I mean. You get the positive vibes. Absolutely. I love that. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about nature and you know, bringing, and I, Rachel, we'll go back to you. I know you bring, you know, nature and natural elements are such a big, uh, you know, cornerstone of your design work. So how do you do that? Like, what, is this something also, is it dri driven by the client or do you always just inc include nat natural elements in your work? Always. I mean, frankly, we are nature and we seem to forget that. 
Um, and so, I don't know, we were just talking earlier about how, like, which I've always believed that, you know, when we see the grain of, a, of wood, like, we, we are reminded that, you know, this was grown over hundreds of years, oftentimes, right? And that, that it, it's part of our DNA, it's part of our history. And so that, you know, bringing, bringing woods in with expressed grains, like you see here, um, you know, and natural fibers like wools, you know, I bring, you know, I like to think about all the finishes as a natural element. They don't all read that way. Um, but again, it's the story that you tell behind the bringing in nature. When you put in a countertop in a kitchen and you look at the, you know, the movement in it and you're thinking about all the minerals that created this over thousands of years, like how magical is that? Yeah. So it, it's, it's really how you see the space that is about bringing nature because frankly, we all have some level of nature in our environment. Um, so yeah, and then you know, big windows, and it's right. important to me that we that we again like, you know, as you're talking about sitting around a big fire pit and being outside, and like that we actually are invited outside, and that you can do that with large openings and framed views and things like that. Okay, and Brandon, same with you. Like, how did how did Varellen bring in natural elements? Yeah, we don't like nature. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look around. Um, yeah. I think it, we're, we're we we. There's no greater teacher than nature. Mm -hmm. um, I was at the, and this is not to toot the horn. I was in Minnesota, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna go to the, I'm gonna go to the Floyd Memorial while I'm in, in Minneapolis. And I met a gentleman um, named Frank Yellow, and he was Lakota, homeless. And we talked for quite some time. His father is actually a, a really well-known um, native painter named Francis Yellow. Does some really interesting political work. But talking to him, and he said, you know, isn't it interesting how mankind, uh, we think we're all strong, but everything that we build and do, its sole purpose is to protect us from nature, because mm -hmm. we're so fragile. And it, it just was an interesting conversation we were having. Um, but I don't think there's any greater teacher than nature. And if you can incorporate that into your lives so that you can observe it and touch it and be around it, I think it makes you more of a whole person. And, and more of a whole being. Right, and yeah. I think also now we, we are so tied to technology, we all have our phones and everything, and so that having that natural balance, you know, kind of, it's a good thing to have in our lives, you know, reminds us of simpler things. Yeah. So the art of handcrafted items is obviously on the rise, thank God, you know. <laughs> so Zubair, why do you think that is? Why do people find uh, handcrafted, things made by people's hands, why, they, why does that have such resonance? Well, I think, you know, um, going back with what everyone is saying, um, you know, nature, our environment is the best designer mm -hmm. in terms of shape, color, uh, all of it. And so for us, um, what's important, um, you know, dealing with an art that is over 2000 years old, the weaving, um, it, it gives us a, a, an immense pleasure to to bring, to keep that craftsmanship alive and, and then bring changes to make it, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, but we're trying to make it better and better and we're introducing new patterns, new colors, um, new textures. You know, we come from a tradition where we sit on the floor. So whatever we sit on has to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. So to bring that to the West, uh, Western homes and, and decor, and sort of like play off of what what they do, and, and and create rugs so that it works beautifully with that with with the furniture, with the uh, with the flooring, and all of that. You know, that is something that we always keep in mind. And the, what better way to do it it is to do it with hand. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think it's. It's also keeping the integrity of of, uh, of the product. Um, I think you know. Oftentimes we 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 have become a society of waste, and so everything is made faster. Uh, everything is made in mass production. And for me, um, if we keep 
the craftsmanship of any uh, art, whether it's weaving, furniture, uh, all of it, I think that people will see it differently and value it differently. So, um, so I, you know, for me, it's it's really important to keep that craft going for the next generations. Can you talk a little bit about the women, the women weavers, and your and like the community uh, that does the rugs? Sure. We um, so the weaving culture in Afghanistan has always been uh, primarily um, by women. Uh, and it's a it's a it's a cottage industry where where people have looms in their homes while they live in a community of big families. They also can can do uh, weaving, which brings extra income for them. Uh, so we about 10, 12 years ago we started a workshop. We turned my dad's house actually it was sitting empty into a weaving center for for women um, because there's a lot of women after the war especially during the, uh, the Taliban time, they have no male income. So this was a very good way to get them out of their homes and empower them and give them that, that um, confidence to come out and be part of a group. And this is all women-run business, uh, a weaving center that is, uh, that is, so far we have about 125 women that are working. And, um, and some of them are weavers from, from, uh, from their families, and some of them are we're teaching them how to weave. So it's, it's, um, you know, it's basically to get them, get them out of their homes and, and be, build a community where they can have, be part of the income for their own families. And so. Mm. Yeah. Uh, was it hard in the beginning to get them to do it? I mean, oh, go, yes. you? Yeah. <laughs> it's very um, you know a lot of people don't realize um, in Afghanistan you, you have to be really sensitive with, uh, with you know the culture uh, especially a country that's been going you know been doing with war for over four years you can't just go knock on people's doors and say hey can you let your mom <laughs> sister or right. wives come in and work at this place where they have no um, idea what's going on so it was a lot of convincing. It's a lot of you know being sensitive to, to the to the families and, and trying to convince the elders to, to to show them what we were doing and and slowly slowly it wasn't like you know a hundred women showed up one day and started weaving. It was you know five women and then turned into 10, 10 to fifteen and and then what we also do is to for their safety of the women we actually pick them up from from their homes or pick up points close to their homes, we bus them to where this workshop is, which is a relatively in a very safe neighborhood. And then after eight hours of uh, work, we hire the same buses to take them back to, uh, to their dropping points to keep their safety in mind for, you know. So, so yeah, it was, it was not an easy work. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, uh, we had a pre-panel discussion, you had mentioned how, um, uh, you know, sometimes when you have a handmade product, you see on the hand tag maybe the picture of the person who made that item. But you were saying like you really, you know, even on your website, if you see a woman, the women weavers, you, do, you don't see her face. Yeah, I mean it's it's uh, it's quite you know it's it, you have to again like you have to be very sensitive to to the culture mm -hmm. and us even us being Afghans, um, you know, we we can't just come in and say hey pose for a photo so that I right. can use it for for. Uh, for social media, for social yeah, media, yeah. And all of that. But also, also the main thing is to keep their safety. Um, we have to be really sensitive to, uh, you know, it's Afghanistan. You have to keep in mind that it's so, you know, especially in the past year with the Taliban coming back, uh, you, their their safety is priority number one for us. And so, which is why we can't advertise mm -hmm. what we do very freely whether it's a magazine or social media or, or such. Um, but yeah, I mean, taking photos, you you really have to be you know, careful, careful yeah. Yeah. yeah, or have, get their permission first. Yeah. <laughs> um, Tom, I know you talked about uh, Eddie's, uh, you know, his work and, and the Kenyan community. I was wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more about how he gives back to that community. And it's uh, yeah, the easiest way. Every every picture being sold, 
uh, 10, no, 15% goes to the model yeah. and 10% goes to the community. So, um, and the, the coffee table books are, are displayed. You will see that uh, he has more than, uh, I would say 2000 pictures. So uh, he contributes very well <laughs> to the society. Uh, not only financially, but it, it, uh, it gives them, uh, it, it actually it's a tribute to these ladies and the self-esteem of these ladies, it's, it's yeah, that's the, big, the biggest contribution you can give, that, that uh, um, they, they consider themselves as the Howard Campbells, right. and, and actually that was his, his first, uh, uh, yeah, first uh, goal, is to increase their self-esteem and, and to, to um, expose this, this, this the strength uh, throughout the world. But English is not my mother tongue. Okay. That's, that's, <laughs> that's great, thank you. So sustainability is obviously a big topic, thankfully, uh, but people are realizing it's more than, than using the products. It's, it, it could be, you know, the, the be mindful of the, the waste, it could be labor related, it could be using local resources, um, can you all talk about how sustainability plays into the concept of intentional design choices? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> sustainability, right? We've got a planet that <clears throat> needs to be inherited. Yeah. One that is uh, safe and not underwater or on fire. Um, we make choices, and I think, I think Tom can attest, right? Uh, you walk a really thin line, and I'll give you a really good example. Um, you can get all of the pay-to-play stamps and seals, and that is what they are, is pay-to-play stamps and seals. They don't audit you. All they're looking for is a manifest of intent. That's it. They don't ever check to see what your practices actually are, and you get the seal. Um, what we do instead, um, I'll give you, this is probably the best example, is we used to use 100% hemp cordage in all of our eight-way hand tie in the spring systems, and it was sustainable and all of that. But occasionally it would break in the field because it's hemp. I mean, hemp's a very strong fiber, but occasionally with, you know, hard use, it would break. Well, then what? You're picking up a sofa, you're trucking it back to our facility, you're tearing it down, you're fixing it, you're trucking it back to the customer, so you have waste material, you're burning fossil fuel. So we found 100% polyethylene plastic cordage that'll never break. So which is the better option, right? We could be, oh, we're using 100% sustainable hemp. Or we have a lifetime product that's not gonna go in a dumpster. Right. Or be trucked on a ship, a, a truck on a, you know, multiple right. times. So we, that's how operationally and our owners, I, very circumspectly, they look at the sourcing of everything. Try to always do the next right thing and make the best decision for the longevity of the product of the planet. Okay, what about, uh uh, wood uses? Do you do a lot of local wood or? Yeah, a lot of either local or regional um, and FSC certified typically. And if it's not FSC certified, um, it's going to be coming from old world, like old old wood growth stands, mm -hmm. multi-generational particularly. Um, a lot of these old growth wood stands, um, because they're multi-generational, think about it, they're the ones that are looking to secure the business interest of their lineage, right, for generations to come. And so they, when they do research on these, these hardwood stands, they actually have a net positive impact on the environment. Hmm. So they're dropping dead wood and leaving nursery logs. They're more concerned about soil erosion. They're more concerned about the health of the trees than any of these just large timber companies. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah. I think, uh, I mean, wood rugs the same way. It's, uh, first of all, it's made with the most environmentally natural fibers <laughs> that one can find. It's wool mm -hmm. and cotton. So. And, but for us, we, we try to be very sensitive, uh, you know, in terms of what kind of dyes we use, how much of it we use, or where that water goes to. Uh, if you notice in a lot of our uh, patterns and designs, we try to keep using natural undyed wool and play, play off with the design, play off of those colors with the design and, and, and create rugs that not only are, are, are or uh, environmentally in terms of uh, you know the dyes or what type of dyes are used or uh, but also there's no other any other chemicals used in these rugs it's the most natural wool fiber hand spun wool and cotton um, that 
that we use that has been the process of it is even the leftover wool is reused in making other rugs so there's no wastage and then also the, we try to keep the quality in mind that if you're going to have this rug you're going to have it for a very very long time you're not going to take this rug and use it for five six years and then throw it away right you're going to hit it down yeah so so that's you know we keep any yeah so we keep that in mind and when we when we make a collection and use the rugs anyone else well, I love that you just said it has many lives, right? Yeah. Because I think that's, you know, for us, from an architectural standpoint, you know, this conversation started, well, actually, back when I was in grad school, I was kind of told, don't waste your time thinking about sustainability. Um, and then, but I always was. And, and so, but in architecture, the conversation has been going on longer. And I remember maybe even like 10 years ago, looking for furniture and, and, and even rugs and carpets that were sustainable, that you know, had no dyes or you know, the wood was sustainably uh, harvested and it was really difficult, right? Like, it was really difficult. And so, so much has happened in, in the last even really five years, I feel like. Um, and so we definitely pay attention to that. I think the other part though is, you know, working with artisans and you know actual weavers actual fabricators because frankly you know when you're a small batch or you're you know a smaller company like your the sustainability is just also economic sustainability mm -hmm. right like and that is also important you know whether that's you know women in Afghanistan or whether that's in the United States like you're contributing to people's lives in it and in some ways I guess I could probably make the argument that even a factory worker you know who's mass producing something there's some level of like jobs and yeah. economic sustainability that actually has to happen too but for me like I like to understand like who's touching this piece mm -hmm. so I can tell the story so that I can you know bring it full circle and that's really sustainability to me it's not just the materials I was curious, like, why in graduate school they were telling you not to worry about it? It was kind of apparently I'm that old. <laughs> but <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I don't. I mean, they just didn't think that it was all that valid of a conversation yet. Wow. Okay. You know, it really wasn't. And uh, you know, when there were all these things to think about from a design standpoint, like don't sustainability was just kind of like, you know, that that doesn't have that much value, yeah. right? We weren't worried about the environment now. Thank God we are now. Yeah. Some of us were. I mean, yeah. my father was, my family was. So. Also, uh, for us, it's, um, you know, we, we are exposed to so much chemicals that we don't know of mm -hmm. right. in, in our homes, whether it's the paint or, you know, cleaning products and such. You want to you wanna bring a product or put, put something down that has, you know, that doesn't add to that anymore. Right. You know, like if I, if you know, I want I want to make a rug where, you know, I don't have any kids. But when I do have kids, I want them to eat, you know, uh, freely crawl and sit and and eat off of, uh, uh, you know, the, the off, off the off the floor. I mean, off the rug. I mean, right. I mean, no. Um, so so when you when you when we want to make rugs, you know, we wanted to have it made the most natural. And you know, mm -hmm. with let you know, no chemicals used, such as glues and you know things like that, where other products have that. Right. So you know, it is so many things important. that we have no idea what we're breathing in. Absolutely. You know, as yeah. Going through this. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So we have, we've been talking about how you help clients and customers make more meaningful um, design choices. So I was wondering if each of you could talk about how you personally do that. Is there, how do you do that in your own lives, whether that's by habits or practices you have? That's just a huge question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, for myself, again, it's about ritual and it's about honoring the process. It's about you know, reverence for the interconnectedness of humanity through the craft. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's about you know mindful 
uh, curation of materials and products that I have in my home. It's about uh, it's about the food that I eat and that I make for my family. Um, and hopefully it's about the way that I run my office and that, you know, everybody has a voice and that there's equity and that we're inviting people to the table with different opinions uh, and it's about listening. Uh, so the idea of, you know, designing what matters is when we're designing our lives, we're designing our environment. It's all those levels. It's the true authenticity um, where you're going the full spectrum of, of design, of designing our, our entire uh, human experience. Anyone else? No. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to add. <laughs> You're still working on that? <laughs> well, I mean, like for us, um, you know, we have distributors and designers that we're, we're selling our product to. I mean, we're business to business, but they all have their own little microclimates of economy and clientele and you know, all of those things. And my approach from a sales perspective is very anthropological. It's very, who are you as a retailer? Or who are you as a trade showroom? Or who are you as a designer? What are you doing? What are your needs? And really just how can we fill that void and facilitate that? Um, you know, we do have a model for distribution, but um, we make it very flexible and very personal for each one of our clientele, and we've seen great success doing it that way. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, what was the question again? Oh, is that how you personally, <laughs> yeah. you know, make more mindful design choices? Uh, myself, or uh, yeah, how you, do I help with the process? No, how, I, we were asking. I'm asking you personally because we, we know how you work with your clients. Yeah. So I'm just curious about how you, if you if you do anything at home, if how how you make uh, you know intentful uh, or design choices with intent. Oh uh, wow! Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, you can pass. <laughs> I, <did>. I mean. <laughs> I will pass on that one because I have to think about that. It's That's a really okay. good question too. That's okay. So soon we're going to open up to questions if anyone has any uh, they'd like to ask. But I thought maybe could also everyone could talk about what they're what you're working on now. What's what are you designing uh, now that you'd like to talk about? What's next? You know, during the pandemic we all were do, working on a lot of residential work. Obviously, everybody's really excited making their home their their. Um, canvas. Um, right now, though, we're actually working on a tremendous number of community projects. It, they're places that people can come together and connect and uh, share experiences. And I find that really exciting because so many people, even while creating a flourishing home environment, um, have been missing community. Right, so I just think that you know we need to find a balance where we can be out and share share energy and ideas and thoughts and creativity. Um, so anyway, we're working on a number of public markets where there are food markets and small makers. We're working on uh, a makers market, um, a micro theater, movie theater. So again, just sharing art. So things like that. Uh, I just think it's an exciting time to, to see how things evolve. Wonderful. Tom, what's up for you? Yeah, besides uh, representing Eddie, um, we're also representing other uh, small ateliers out of Belgium, Eden James, amongst others, uh, uh, planters, clay planters. Um, they are pieces of art, it's not just a planter, it's a piece of art. Um, but due to the whole logistics uh, hassles and uh, supply chain issues, etc., etc., we decided to start production in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So that's everything. Like, are you, pl are you planters? Uh, not all the planters, okay. but uh, selection. Um, and we will also start making wooden planters, mm -hmm. etc., etc. So local production. Um, avoiding the logistics uh, hassles and, and costs. Uh, Where in the US? Like what region? Are you uh, <laughs> the nice city of High Point. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. That's convenient. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, for us, we are uh, we're excited to uh, uh, 
build a second uh, women's weaving f facility. Yes. Uh, we're, uh, we're excited about that and hopefully expand the program beyond um, uh, what we have right now. Um, we're really excited to work on collections where we are bringing in, uh, focusing on, um, on tribal nomadic art uh, from different parts of uh, countries where they don't have the platform or their art is not seen uh, or haven't been used in home decor and we're trying to translate that in our craft and create a beautiful um, you know patterns and uh, play with, uh, with with different textures and and of course uh, you know everything uh, done in Afghanistan and keeping keeping the creative uh, 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 process going and teaching people that there is more possibilities beyond just making your own traditional rugs, but here's here's something that you can do. If you don't work with us, you can start your own workshop or your own looms, set up your own looms, but if you weave these type of rugs, this would do much better. Mm. And there's more market for these kind of goods. So, so we were very proud of that. And I think that, you know, we're gonna continue doing that. So, Wonderful, that's great. Thank you. Um, we've expanded 40,000 more square feet of production, so that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, we've needed to do that for some time, and it's, you know, we're finishing that up. Um, new, always new products, always new uh, new design, mm -hmm. which is always exciting. We love debuting uh, those things during the market, of course. So October, we're going to have new fabrics, new textiles, uh, new silhouettes and frames. Um, and if you've been to our little campus down in High Point, um, that might be changing in the next few years. It might be... Uh, quintupling in size and uh, all of our frienders and everybody else are going to be a, a very welcome part of that so we're pretty excited to see that come to fruition over the coming years too. So, so stay tuned. Yeah. yeah stay tuned. Stay tuned for something really cool one day. Right, so, right. Uh, is it anyone? already is really cool though. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Uh, yes, young lady. <laughs> Thank you. For Rachel. So these community projects did you do, like, how did you start tapping into that? Did they see your work? Did, are you working with one developer? How did the community? I mean, part of it was because we started the conversation, right? Like, you know, we were lucky enough to have a relationship with one of the, you know, um, just as an example with Montclair Film, we, we had already done a, a micro theater for them. And then we worked on their, and then we're working on their six theater cinema. And so that's like a place where people, with the intention of coming together, that's an organization, right? So because it's an organization and they provide education and they provide actual film, like we started having the conversation about people coming together. And just as, a, as an individual, I have been involved in a lot of local organizations, either on the board or, or just as a sponsor or donor. And, and so, you know, I've talked to the founders of these, these, these organizations over the years. And I think my genuine interest really was ultimately what got them to come back and say, hey, like, we have this idea. Do you think you can help us make it happen? Um, but also, you know, I just kept talking about community and, you know, that in community is where we heal, where we, uh, you know, figure we remember who we are. So, I love that. Right. Wonderful. With that, thank you, panel. That was a wonderful conversation. And thank you for joining us today. And, uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.